So our first speaker is going to be Frieso van Vollenhoven from Go Data Driven. On, uh, <coughs> going to talk about understanding the tech community through notebooks. Thank you. Oh well, I can hear myself. That's cool. Hope you can hear me too. Is it all right in the back? Awesome. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, for coming this morning. Um, I'll. Um, be delivering a talk to you about understanding the tech community through notebooks. Um, obviously, it has to be through notebooks, right? This is by data. It couldn't be otherwise. But um, what I'm what I'm really about to tell you about is is basically my, let's say, background project. Right? You have a lot of work, you have a lot of things to do, and there's always this one thing that you kind of get back to every every other week or so for for maybe a couple of hours, and then at some point these things kind of get out of hand. Um, that's exactly what happened here. And um, by now, it's actually resulted in uh, quite a nice little product that I'll uh, show you how we created that. So uh, this is basically a notebook-based exploration of meetup.com. So who, who here knows about meetup? OK, so maybe the other way around. Who has never been to a meetup before? All right. Um, let me explain you a little bit about that. Uh, before that, about this talk, so this is basically a list of tools that might be useful for you, a number of packages, a number of frameworks, a number of ways of doing things. Um, and this is also an exploratory analysis of local tech communities through meetup.com. About me, I'm the CTO for GoData Driven. Um, I think we're actually kind of responsible for uh, having this event in Amsterdam in the first place. Uh, at some point, somebody went to London and came back, and the next morning told me, hey, Frieza, we're doing PyData in Amsterdam. Like, okay. So here we are. Um, yeah, that's my uh, GitHub profile picture. Uh, Frieza is also a very popular brand of, um, uh, I think, dairy products for infants or something. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, FZK, uh, that should be easy to remember. I'm on GitHub as well, uh, not too much stuff there. Um, also, for Go Data Driven, apart from the CTO role, I'm basically the chief meetup organizer. So here in Amsterdam, I organize the uh, Hadoop user group. Um, I organize a, uh, or co-organize a, a, a meetup on applied machine learning together with somebody uh, who is in uh, the academic world. And also, I'm uh, partly responsible for the Amsterdam Apache Spark meetup. So I have a keen interest in meetups, um, as do many people. So what is a meetup? Basically, according to uh, the good people of meetup themselves, it is the world's largest network of local groups, uh, making it easy to organize local events uh, where people get together and the mission there is to basically to revitalize the local community and help people around the world self-organize. So that means that people, you know, people get together um, uh, through, through an online meeting platform where they make arrangements for meeting in, in the offline real world and do things like, you know, build houses or clean up the neighborhood or go knitting in the park and lots of yoga, I suppose, as well. Uh, so so that's, that's really what Meetup is about, you know, getting together in the real world. So if you um, look at Meetup, um, in general, it's, it's an event-based social network. It focuses on uh, events which are organized by, by groups. So uh, every Meetup event belongs to a Meetup group. And those groups have members, and the groups are discussing particular topics that they uh, inherently care about like yoga, um, or self-help, or I don't know, um, Apache Spark, right? So uh, that's the idea. Um, but there's a couple of things that we kind of also use meetup.com for. Um, and I think primarily uh, my prior about this audience would be that you are pretty much familiar with the tech meetup uh, specialization in there. So that's, that's kind of single evening, many conferences, and you get usually free access, and um, also like pizza and beer for free have kind of become a commodity in tech centers, uh, because you can just go anywhere every, every evening of the week. Uh, so for us, meetups actually look a lot like this, right? After work, we go in dark rooms, and we have lots of pizza and perhaps a couple of beers, and um, we, we talk about work again, um, which is uh, interesting enough. And the funny thing is, actually, that's what we use Meetup for the most. 
Because if you look at the number of groups there are for each particular category that Meetup uh, has, then you see these two spikes uh, in that distribution. So the one on the left, the red one, is uh, the category of business meetups. And the really big one on the right there is the category of tech or technology meetups. So that means if you, look, if you run into somebody who knows about meetups, then knowing nothing else, uh, the likelihood of them being in tech meetups is by far the greatest. Um, there, there, there's 36, I think, or so categories, um, but in the end, in reality, the majority of meetup activity is just tech. I think that's good for us, if nothing else. Um, probably keeps the platform running as well. And uh, it also inspires a lot of uh, you know, good intentions with people. So one of the things that happens a lot is people get carried away in their enthusiasm and you say, say you know what, we'll start a meetup group. And then kind of slack off and never really organize any events in there. Uh, but by the way, this is just for Amsterdam. And the same here, this is just about the, the Amsterdam meetup community. Um, the, this particular behavior of starting a group and then never organizing an event is actually 12% of all tech meetups. Um, so, you know, about one in 10 of us has just the good intentions and, and that's it. Now, obviously, um, Meetup as a platform is growing pretty rapidly, right? So if you look at the number of meetups over time that exist right here in Amsterdam, and this is just tech meetups, then uh, you can imagine, well, 12% of the meetups never really organized anything, but that could be because they're just brand new, right? Most of the meetups will be recent because the platform is growing so rapidly. But then if you look into it a little bit, and this is a bit of a weird plot because the, um, the bidding isn't uniform, uh, but this is basically the <coughs> a histogram of the age in days of meetup groups that never organized anything. So you can see right here, there's about 12 meetups that were created in, in let's say, the last week uh, at the time of collecting this data that never did anything, and I think they're excused, right? You're, you're still getting your group together, you're working on things, but then there, there's 35 meetups that were created between a week and a month ago that never did anything as well, and then there's this entire group here, which is a year and another year. So those are groups that are well over a year old and never really did anything. But it turns out there's other uses as well. So um, many, many people in, uh, let's say, the evangelism business have learned that Meetup has a quite nicely working recommender system that will send you emails uh, of about anything you put in there as long as you check the right topics that are supposedly interesting to your Meetup. And this is 2.5% of all tech Meetups being just an announcement for something else and not actually being an event right there on Meetup. So maybe they should work on that a little bit. So that's nice. A couple of things we learned about Meetup. So the question now is how do we know all of this, right? Well, um, obviously I didn't go onto meetup.com and click around through the site, um, copy pasting all of this stuff into Excel. So um, Meetup has an API that you can quite liberally use to grab uh, a substantial amount of data from them. It's there on the, um, on the website. It's very well documented. It gives you a complete view of everything that happens on the platform, as long as you're a member yourself. And also, it's um, reasonably generous when it comes to rate limiting. Um, and it does a proper implementation of REST. <coughs> um, this is an example of request. Here we're basically getting um, everything in category 34, which is tech uh, in country Netherlands, city Amsterdam. We're looking for three results a page, and we only want to see the, the names and the organizers' uh, name of, of, of meetup groups. So this HTTP command is uh, coming from something called HTTP. You should really get that if you ever do command line REST calls. Um, it's so much easier than, than curl. So what you get out of it is obviously response uh, headers that will have some, some, some rate limiting information as well. And then subsequently you get a bunch of JSON showing the metadata. So that says there I have three results, but then also I have 897 results in total, uh, which is if I go to the next page, the next page, the next page, and so on, you get all that. And then finally there's the actual 
JSON body of the results as well. So that's nice. <coughs> now, let's look at what we're up to. Basically, what I wanted to do is get a feeling for um, the, the tech community at large. And I figured it probably is a good idea to start with the uh, more interesting technology centers that are out there in terms of software engineering. Um, so me being from Amsterdam, I put that first. I think that's a natural tendency for people from Amsterdam. Um, and then I figured Berlin, London, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco should be nice as well. Actually, I didn't do Chicago initially, but I did at some point I wanted more English language content to, to train particular models. So we look for all of the groups within a 100 mile radius of these cities, and then uh, Meetup will basically give a whole lot of stuff. Um, so I scheduled uh, a little scraper that I wrote in Python to, uh, um, to go through the API and get all the information on the groups, the events, the members, the RSVPs, so the people that actually uh, express that they're coming to an event. The longest of these jobs takes about 19 hours to run, which is for San Francisco, understandably. Um, and I scheduled this uh, with Jenkins. Does anybody not know what Jenkins is? All right, so Jenkins is technically a, a built server. However, um, you can nicely abuse it as a scheduler because it will run your jobs on a schedule and then also capture the output and it can send you emails if things fail. So this is my Jenkins instance, and you can see here that there's a lot of jobs starting with Meetup Downloader. Um, so those will nicely, uh, on, on particular days of the week, do a full run of these jobs that grabs all the data for a particular city. And obviously this thing can fail for, for many reasons, um, although red limiting hasn't been one of them yet, because it turns out the Meetup API is so slow that if you don't hit it uh, with any parallelism, uh, you never hit the rate limiting. Um, this is probably also why the San Francisco job takes 19 hours, because the data set that comes out of it is on the order of four and a half gigabytes. So that shouldn't take 19 hours. But hey, <laughs> other things happen. You get broken connections every now and then. You get a, you get a server error and these kind of things. So um, what I did in the end is create a job that basically keeps track, uh, keeps a list of all of the URLs that it still needs to hit uh, in, in a little SQLite database. And then um, it's just resumable, so you can, um, it can break, and then we can just restart it, and it'll pick up where it left off. Uh, and then also the, the JSON blobs that it gets out of it will go into SQLite as well in uh, just a little local database. Um, probably I could have done this with Scrapey as well, um, but I, I had already started on doing a little resting myself, so finish that. So that basically gives me a SQLite database with all the downloaded JSON blobs for all of these meetup activity in these big cities or these, these tech cities. Um, which is nice because it's a full data set, but obviously it isn't very convenient for many purposes because, well, I have um, JSON blobs in a database without indexes or anything else. So when I, when I was thinking about the domain of the problem, um, obviously, it, initially, it always makes sense to just think, okay, I'll do this in MySQL or Postgres or something like that, because I can query nicely with, with SQL. But if you, if you really think about the meetups, um, it, it, it is inherently network structured. Um, so instead of doing a relational database, I um, used a graph database to store this data which actually gives you a, a lot of interesting opportunities. So the graph database that I use is Neo4j. It's, uh, there's a community op edition which is open source and there's an enterprise edition which can do additional things. Um, but in the end, uh, it will store a graph and provide you with a nice uh, API and also query language for it. So Neo4j stores a, uh, what we call property graph. So that means on the vertices and on the edges of the graph, you can store properties as well. Um, and then you can also use those properties when querying, which is, um, which is very nice. There's excellent Python support through uh, a package called Pythonio, and there is a, um, a query language which is called Cypher, um, which basically is like uh, using ASCII art to describe what you want. So um, you can do things like give me uh, me, which is a member, uh, by the name, 
like that. So that's basically an index lookup. And then, well, just return that. Um, that should give me something, but not me. You guys are awake, thank you. So this gives me a lot of me's because I, uh, I obviously ran these jobs for, for, for different cities, so I'm in there a couple of times. So I can also do this predicate where there should be this additional Amsterdam label on me, and then it will give me just me right here in Amsterdam. Uh, this is the, the, the graphical view, and you can also get the view in terms of rows where you just say, um, you know, for each node and the properties that are in there. So this is nice, and you can do things like um, uh, this, for example, where I say, okay, um, I am uh, me, a member, and then there is a venue out there somewhere, and basically give me the shortest path between me and a venue for which this predicate applies. The city is Den Bosch, which is uh, somewhere in the south of, uh, of the Netherlands. And then when you run that query, it's going to take a while, but in the end, it will, it will basically uh, come up with this, where me uh, is right here, so that's, that's me, and then this is a venue in Dumbles, this is a venue in Dumbles, and this is one, and it gives me the shortest paths to, uh, to each of them. Which, which is kind of nice, because um, you can uh, um, do, do quick explorations that way. This is what we call my ego network, so this is basically give me anything connected to me through a relation called RSVP to an event, which is organized by some group, so that's um, a query that spans multiple uh, vertices and edges, and it will give anything that matches that, which is the network of me and all of the meetup events that I ever went to, including the groups that organized them. So this is nice, and um, also nice is the fact that um, you can also do these kinds of queries, where instead of returning vertices and edges, you can return uh, individual fields like names or, or uh, properties of nodes and edges, and also um, aggregates like counts. So that basically means instead of getting a graph back, you get just tabular data back. So it's, it, it's a nice way of getting um, the graph data in a tabular form back to you. And then, of course, there's Python integration through uh, something called Pythonio, which uh, allows you to create this graph object that accesses the graph database through REST. And then you can do something like, what's the database size? And it'll get you uh, a number back right here. It says there's about 2.6 million things in my database. Um, you can query. Uh, oh, that looks horrible. If, if you have the notebook in the normal uh, screen, it will actually nicely align and be a little table. So here we uh, basically get the last 10 events that I went to. And then Pythonia will give you that back in, in, in some kind of uh, character representation if you um, represent it. Uh, but then the result set actually has um, some, some more interesting properties. So the, the result object uh, is iterable, um, and then also it's list-like, so it's fully materialized, so you, you can do things like get me the last element. And then the records within the result set are also dictionary-like, but they're also objects that you see uh, on top where I just use uh, the object notation, but you, you can also get them through a dictionary notation. Uh, especially for aliases that have spaces in them and other things that wouldn't be uh, normally expressible in, in the Python language. And then um, it's pretty trivial to construct uh, a pandas data frame out of this. So uh, what I'm doing here is using the fact that the result set is iterable and just feed that to the data, stream, uh, data frame constructor, possibly renaming the columns, and then um, all of a sudden I'm in pandas world which is nice for a couple of things, and we'll, we'll look at that later. And then there's this uh, IPython cipher package, which um, helps you with a couple of uh, nice things. Uh, first of all, um, you can do uh, inline cipher queries using a magic, and then uh, assign that to uh, some kind of result. And the nice thing about the result object that you get from uh, this IPython cipher package is that the representation is a lot nicer this way. Uh, but also that it has this get data frame function that will yeah return you a data frame, um, so you're more easily in in uh, into pandas then. And then there's cell level magic for just putting a query there and viewing the results in your notebook. So 
Now that we have this set up, there's a couple of things that we can trivially do. So for example, when I'm organizing a meetup every now and then, I sometimes need to look for a venue. And one of the easiest things to do then, especially if, if the group is pretty substantial in size, is basically say, okay, give me all of the venues in Amsterdam that ever hosted anything before and sort them by some kind of uh, median event size and, uh, and tell me which are, uh, which, which are the groups that they've hosted. So then what you get is this, this entire list of venues and I can see the uh, median event size that happened there and the groups that were ever hosted at that venue. So this is really convenient for me, so I can just send out a bunch of emails to, to venues that are probably uh, in the market for hosting one of the data meetups. So that's nice um, and really convenient. So you can do things like this, where you basically say, okay, uh, I run a query that will give me the, um, the size of each of the meetup groups, and then uh, I put that in a data frame, and then subsequently I just do a histogram like this, and it will tell me most of the meetup groups are pretty small. And then there's a couple of larger ones. Uh, and there, there's a lot of like these power distributions in there, which are to be expected. So one other thing that I, um, I think is interesting to look at is the, um, the overlap between different meetup groups. That basically tells you something about how alike are these two audiences. Um, when there's overlap, um, it's really hard to not think about Venn diagrams, and luckily there's a package that creates Venn diagrams in Matplotlib. Um, it's really nice, you can do a Venn diagram out of two or three sets, and you just feed it a number of sets. So uh, we define this little function here that does a cipher query, uh, gets the member sets for a couple of uh, meetup groups, and then feeds that to this Venn diagram function, and it can do this. So um, we have here the, the PyData Netherlands and the Amsts are dumb meetup group with lots of hyphens there and other things which may or may not be a reference to um, well, the syntax of the language. But it's um, quite obvious that there's a bit of overlap. The R meetup group is larger because it's been around longer and it, it was to be expected that there was some overlap there. And you can do the same with the graph database group in the Netherlands. And then you get this, this di nice diagram of the different um, number of uh, co-occurrences in those member sets. And then um, we can do something like this, where you see that there's, uh, you know, the R and the, uh, the graph database and the PyData groups have, have a bunch of overlap, and the graph database and this uh, Coco Hats, which is a mobile app development group, also has some overlap, but PyData doesn't have overlap with Coco Hats. So this sort of might imply that there's like two different communities out there that do have some form of common interest, but not entirely, or not enough to, to be a community. And then obviously there's also completely disjoint things, which is kind of disturbing because, you know, out of the, the data community right here in the Netherlands, absolutely zero are part of the uh, elite group of tomorrow's IT leaders. So obviously, I, I immediately try to fix this by signing up for tomorrow's IT leaders meetup group, but it turns out they have to let you in. And <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's a work in progress. I'll keep you posted. But this does quite clearly imply, co combined with, with these kind of things, that there are quite likely um, communities within these network, uh, within these networks. So that, um, that leads us to, to the next topic where uh, we, we start taking a, a bit of a closer look at the network. Um, what I've used for that is a package called iGraph. iGraph is available in Python and in R. It's a C library and has bindings in, uh, in both. Um, it's not entirely ready for Python 3 yet, but there are some trivial fixes that you can do. Um, and I got the, the PR accepted, so it's probably in, in, in an upcoming release, it will all be fixed. Um, otherwise, if you install it right now through pip in Python 3, the plotting is broken. But then again, most of you use Python 2.7 anyway, right? <laughs> iGraph, uh, iGraph is a nice library for you know, working with graphs. Um, it can do some graph global things and, and also do calculations on, on individual vertices, like, like uh, edge between us and, and centrality and these kind of things. Um, and then also uh, there's algorithms for traversal, but also community detection, which is the thing that we're interested in here. Um, 
So uh, this is uh, again um, my uh, my ego network, uh, but then uh, created as an iGraph um, object and then plotted in, in in the notebook. So this is just uh, this isn't my plot lib. It actually generates an SVG. Um, but you can see here, I'm, I'm there in the center. All the cyan uh, vertices are um, events that don't have uh, names on them, and the green things are groups, so they're meetup groups. So, so this is basically my, my um, surrounding in terms of the meetup graph. And then when I expand that by putting like two members in there, you can already see that um, given two members, there, there's in sometimes some commonality, but there's also uh, particular groups that are completely disjoint uh, given these two members. And then when you go on like that and you add people, then obviously you, you kind of see these um, parts in the graph where you have different densities. Um, so uh, instead of actually having a look at that, which is um, fairly hard to visualize and also doesn't really tell you a lot of meaningful things, we're just going to let an algorithm decide these are communities and these aren't. And then from that point on, we'll look into those communities and see whether it makes sense. So uh, what I did is basically take all the meetup groups in Amsterdam and uh, relate them, uh, relate the members to those groups uh, through the uh, events that those members uh, went to, and then um, the the edge weight of an edge between a group and a member is determined by how active that member is in that group with some decay over time. So if I am active in a group more recently, that means more than I used to go there a year ago or something. There's a couple of biases in here because you know uh, sometimes groups just sees activity in general so then nobody is active anymore and there's a couple of other effects that are pretty, pretty hard to, to take into account but generally um, this gives us uh, interesting results already. So we run the community detection in iGraph. So this is uh, basically what we do here. We say, give me everybody uh, in, uh, let's say, the greater Amsterdam area, um, that, uh, and, and then all the activity that was prior to January 1st of this year. Uh, this is also to account for the fact that there's quite some seasonality in, in, the, in the meetup event data. And then um, the data frame that comes out of that is basically a group, a member, and then a timestamp and recency. So we need to transform that into a group, a member, and then something that's uh, that particular weight. Um, and then from there on, we need to construct a graph out of basically this list of edges. And now in iGraph, uh, that's pretty uh, trivial. Actually, you create uh, a graph through something they call a tuple list. Uh, and, uh, what I do here, the graph relations is just the data frame. So that's the one you see here that has these three uh, columns. And I basically tell the values of that data frame is a list of tuples with weights. And boom, you have a graph. And then we can run community detection on that. Um, so the community detection in iGraph has uh, a lot of different algorithms. Most of them are not very scalable. Um, but the, uh, the one that you would primarily use on larger graphs is uh, an iterative method of community detection, which also um, will uh, actually uh, return you a hierarchy of communities, if you like. Um, I think it's called, I'm actually not sure. Oh, here, um, uh, community multi-level. Uh, the implementation, as far as I'm aware, is actually an implementation of what is better known as the Louvain algorithm. Uh, which is a greedy method for, for optimizing uh, network modularity. Um, <clears throat> so it returns you all of the different levels, and then uh, the last level of that is the most coarse-grained. So maybe at the first level it will detect like 300 communities, and then uh, maybe 100, and then the last level is what you actually get, and that's 46. So this is nice because we just went back from, from like 700 or 800, I think 900 meetup groups by now to only 46 communities um, that, that share some commonality and interest, usually, probably, um, because the network was constructed by uh, attaching people to groups based on their uh, activity within that group. So some communities are big and some are small. These are all the different communities that are detected. So 0 to 45, which is 46. And these are the sizes of that community. 
of each of the communities. So you can see the largest one over there is slightly over 3,000, and the smallest one is somewhere, um, well, quite close to zero. So there's, there's a couple of perhaps, I don't know, noisy kind of members in, in the network that don't really add to, uh, to an FT more, more to the global picture. And then when you look at the size distribution, it looks a lot like this. So most of the communities are, um, <coughs> are somewhere between zero and 500, and then there's a couple of larger ones. So uh, what we did next is uh, try and establish a rank. So basically we're going to say, so what is the more Im important community out of, out of these? Um, the way we did that is um, basically take this community detection that we ran in iGraph and then put the results back into the Neo database. So then subsequently it becomes really easy to just query things based on the community that they were part of. And then for each community, uh, we'll just say, okay, so what are the top 10 meetup groups that, that uh, play a role within this community? And from those, we'll say, okay, what is the activity amongst those meetup groups uh, for that community? And that, that, that basically gives us an activity rank. Uh, and then we'll say, so in 2015, this was the most active community within the Amsterdam tech scene. Um, and when you have that, when you have that rank and you have those top end groups for each of the communities, uh, you, you can finally start to look at something and we can, can also kind of compare these different cities. Um, so this is Amsterdam and we're not doing the top 10 here, but it's only the top three. So you can see the community number on the left, which is uh, assigned by, uh, by the algorithm. And then the rank on the right that basically says, so this is the number one meetup group in that community. And so the community numbers obviously don't mean anything. They're just arbitrarily assigned. Um, but the rank does mean anything. And what you can already see here is that there, there is, you know, on the surface of it, some commonality between the groups that go in a community. So you can see that in Amsterdam, this whole startup and innovation thing is really big. And then secondly, there's like the DevOps crowd. And then on the third place, alas, there is the uh, big data and data science. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, moving on front end, uh, general web development. Uh, Internet of Things and, and um, smart, smart cities and these kind of things. And then here is PHP and other general uh, development. So when we take Amsterdam and we compare this to uh, Berlin, you can already see that there's, um, there, there's commonalities, but there's also some differences. So for example, in, uh, in Berlin, um, the microservices is actually a thing. Um, and then a uh, second, uh, second community there is pretty much the big data, data science. So perhaps in that sense, they're ahead of us. And then, um, well, in Berlin also, Node.js is actually a thing, but that's also more like the general software uh, development, right? The general web development, Node.js, Meteor, which is, I think, in, uh, a PHP CMS or something. No? Huh? It's Node. It's Node. Ah, right, makes sense. Okay, so that, that's all JavaScript then. Uh, and then there's uh, Geek Girls and, and Open Tech. And that's interesting because we don't have that in Amsterdam. Um, I'm not sure about the, the Open Tech, but we don't have um, you know, uh, meetups uh, specifically targeted at um, getting women to code that are also the most active ones. I mean, they're there, but they don't surface into the top 10. But if you go on to, uh, let's say, not London, but San Francisco, you see there, um, the, 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 the women who code um, is, is a larger community that ha actually has several meetup groups focusing on just that. And also, over time, they've already went down in the top 10 a bit. So that basically means that um, on the technology side, in Amsterdam, we're not doing too horribly, although the, the big data and data science is only in third place, so we need to work on that a little bit. But for the rest, there's like these, these other kinds of movements that for some reason we completely don't take part at. So shame on you, Amsterdam. Um, but perhaps it's just a matter of you know, uh, getting the activity count up. Um, so, this, so this is interesting. Uh, we, we basically get... Um, an idea of uh, the different uh, sub-communities within the tech scene in these different cities. And then, what else can we do? So, uh, we haven't looked at the, the, the contents of these events yet and, the co and, and what these groups 
uh, are, are made up of. Um, but it turns out on Meetup, uh, all of the groups actually at group creation specify a number of topics that, will, that supposedly interest the people who become a member of that group. And then uh, from there on, obviously, a group will at some point start organizing events and those have descriptions and there's a lot of textu textual data that we could, could have a look at as well. So, um, what, we, uh, what we aim to do then is basically try and come up with uh, an unsupervised and automated way of, of building um, you know, a global picture of what, what these communities and what these meetups are about that, that um, let's say, laymen or IT managers, as we call them, um, can use to figure out you know, what's happening in, in this pool of people that they're so desperately trying to hire from but don't have a clue what these people do on those you know, Thursday evenings in, in a room somewhere with their pizzas and beers. So, um, in the end, that's, um, that's what we're trying to achieve here. So these topics, they're, they're, they're pretty static, right? You create the meetup group maybe some years ago and back then, I don't know, MapReduce was the greatest thing. So, so that became a topic of your group. But then over time, you know, the world changed, but the topics stay the same. But the event descriptions are a lot more dynamic, so they will uh, pick up on, on these new topics or, or related phrases. So um, the big idea here is to yeah, basically use this, these topics to determine what a group is about, but then link those topics to uh, words and phrases that are in the event descriptions, which are more dynamic and will reflect more, let's say, modern um, or, or more recent um, uh, trends in the community. And then uh, we, we try and link all of that together to create one big network visualization because that will also uh, be able to show you for different communities what are, let's say, the topics in between that link them together, but not strongly enough to make them a joint community. Um, I think perhaps before we get to the implementation, just to get you an idea what that looks like. So we figured, hey, we can use all this data to create a technology radar. Uh, one of the marketing people is going to come up with a better name, but this is just my prototype. Um, look, has a nice picture of Amsterdam. There's communities in here. You can see the activity charts uh, for each of the communities. And then uh, for each of the communities, you can see which are the important groups, who are the important people, and then what is the activity within there. And then finally, this is like the big idea of, of these communities linked to their topics and then linked to uh, whatever they, they care about. And that's not readable, but you can see that for here there's PHP web development and then in that vicinity there's PHP stuff. Um, but if you look at, let's say, big data, data science over here and functional programming and scalable systems over here, then the thing that they have in between there is like NoSQL and Hadoop and Cassandra, which is kind of interesting. I don't know how Flask came up there, but we're working on that. So, so what we do is um, we, we take all of the event descriptions uh, that are in English, um, because English is easy and we're lazy, so we have to start somewhere. Uh, there's a Python package called LangDetect, which does that really nicely, especially on, on longer texts like, like event descriptions. Um, it's extremely slow, so uh, it's, it's written in pure Python. and um, uh, and, and it works on, on character trigram distributions. So it has to do all of the, the, the classifications uh, based on that. So, so we trivially parallelize that on the local machine using Apache Spark. Um, uh, then we strip HTML using beautiful soup. I, I'm, I think most of you will have heard of that. And then um, uh, we run uh, Jensum's excellent implementation of work to vec on that, which I think right now is kind of the, the state of the art in easily accessible um, uh, text representation. Um, local parallelism uh, with Spark, a little bit of a sidestep. You can, you can run Apache Spark on your local machine by just firing PySpark, and then where it says local, and then between the, the, the brackets it says eight, that means it, it will take eight cores, and that's it. So uh, that will give you a local um, a runner of Spark using eight cores. And then what we do uh, in Spark is basically say, OK, I'm going to create a parallelized uh, data set out of all of the group IDs that I have in the database. 
So that's a local operation, and I, and then I push that into a parallel data structure. And then from there on, I'm going to say, okay, so now I can do, uh, 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 let's say, a pseudo-distributed operation. So it's going to be distributed across those eight cores, where I say, okay, so each of these um, Spark process is going to take a part of the data and actually fetch those groups from the database. So this will create parallelism against the database, which, of course, it has to be able to handle. Um, but then, if in the end the goal is to parallelize this, this one uh, very slow, pure Python package, uh, this works very nicely. You do have to realize that, that um, especially from Python, Spark has quite a lot of overhead. So, so for, for, for general like I.O. bound kind of things, it's probably better to just stick with local. But uh, in these particular situations, this works uh, quite nicely. And then um, on, on the resulting event descriptions, um, we, we actually don't do a lot of pre-processing at this point, so, so I'm, I'm still working a bit on the, on the text stuff, um, doing a bit of pre-processing, doing, um, trying to, to actually clean up uh, a couple of the nasty things like hashtags and, and URLs and these kind of things, but right now we actually don't do any of that, and already it can do things like this saying, hey, uh, what's similar to machine learning? And it will come up with computer vision and statistical modeling and deep learning and data mining. Um, but also, for iOS, it will know Android and Windows Phone and iPhone and mobile. So that, that's pretty nice, and it's a pretty useful model for, for the thing that we want to create. Um, and then in the visualization, we basically connect communities to the topics that are prevalent in the groups of that community, and then we... Um, we run TF-IDF over that, because a lot of these groups have an interest in computer programming. But yeah. And then um, from those topics, oh well, that actually doesn't fit. Let me see if I can. No, it does. So uh, fr from those uh, topics, we uh, recursively look at the similar terms uh, up to a particular threshold. So the termination criteria is basically um, the similarity should be above some number, and then for each iteration in the recursion, we decay that with a little bit, and then at some point it just stops. And then, um, yeah, the final result is this, which I've uh, just shown you. Um, this, this network of communities and topics and, and related terms. Um, initially, it would perform pretty poorly, uh, but uh, we fixed that by uh, grabbing more data from the API. Hence, uh, Chicago was in there. And I think that's it. Uh, perhaps we have some question time, yep. if there are any. <laughs> 